Welcome to another episode of Source Material. I want to know, Jason Teasley, are you ready to talk some carnage? Of course. It's so fitting that you know your return is an episode <laughs> with me because me and your, you mean you podcasting together goes back quite some time. I, I, I like to say that uh, I, I gave you your big break. You was just a meager young man who that's right who who had very serious doubts about you know doing a podcast. And I back then we was talking off air. We we was talking and reminiscing about the old cheap seats episode, and you was along for the journey on a lot of those as well as Robert Cooper. And we had some uh, fun experiences such as drunken drafts and and Robert getting locked in his laundry room by his mother. But most notably, the tendency I had to. Um, take naps during podcasts so so yeah <laughs> oh, we, we've <laughs> that wasn't like you planned on taking a nap that's for sure no, it no, just happens no. <laughs> the most infamous one it was a episode with ronnie adams it was a screaming boy podcast that they started talking star wars and i fell asleep ah, and, then yes. Matt, and then i woke up and just picked up right wherever we left off and did like after the post-production he was like was you asleep and i was like yeah he was like you said you picked up right where they was le- they left off talking. Oh. So yeah, I mean we've done we've done a few Carnage books together. We've done the the Deadpool versus Carnage. We covered Maximum Carnage with our good friend Benjamin J. Cologne. And now we're about to have some Carnage Unleashed. Yeah, tell me about why this book. This art came to me because uh as you know, the the Venom 2 movie, there will be Carnage just coming out. And this has some some rumors to be tied to so i thought why not better to go through and do this it was an older older comic uh that you know and of course like i said anything carnage you know i'm up for but this one in particular i i like because it kind of blends a couple of genres and some real life stuff in it but this is it, like i said anything carnage i'm always up for i thought that this would be a good good little refresher to go over it's not too heavy it's not too thought provoking uh it's it's a really simple read four issues so a quick basically what i would say is a nice little quick hit Mm -hmm. that gives you a good gives you a good dynamic between the relationship venom and carnage have yeah and the hatred they have for each other for sure for sure uh so venom carnage unleashed gets dropped the first issue gets dropped april of 1995 you can actually find it on shelves february 28th 1995 so the early part of 1995 written by larry hama of gi joe fame penciled by andrew wildman inked by joseph uh it could be joseph or yosef one or the other joseph rubenstein lettered by ken lopez and colored by tom j mcgraw Uh, this was simple four issues and here we go synopsis time That synopsis is right around the corner, but first let me talk about Amazon Music. At the W2M Network, we believe sharing is caring, and what better thing to give than the gift of music? If you head to getamazonmusic.com slash W2M Network, you can get a free 30-day trial where you can check out over 70 million songs. That's getamazonmusic.com slash W, the number 2, M Network, for that free 30-day trial. Uh, In Chicago, Eddie Brock, or as most of us know him, Venom, is upset with the recent fame and fortune Cletus Casty, the murderous Spider-Man villain Carnage, has fell into when the company Excessive Violence Games has created a video game based on Carnage's killing spree. Sound familiar? Irate, Venom decides to pay Carnage a visit at Ravencroft Psychiatric Prison in New York City. Meanwhile, Cletus' psychologist is attempting to break through to the root of his psychosis and feels that allowing Cletus to play an exclusive online version of his own upcoming game is allowing them to make progress. However, things go awry when Cletus discovers that the symbiote is able to travel through the internet, allowing them to use it to attempt to escape. When Eddie arrives in New York, all hell breaks loose, culminating with a showdown between Venom and Carnage that takes place on the World Wide Web. Like I said, brief, very brief synopsis. We've got a lot of, to- uh, you know, there's a lot of finer points to this that I'll probably bring up. But uh, yeah, we got uh, Venom and Carnage going at it on the internet, which is really interesting considering this is 1995. 
really for myself, the internet is just becoming like something that I'm getting used to using. I think I really started, obviously, when I graduated in 96, uh, we went to OU and you were able, you had a, we had a computer in the room and we were able to get on the internet and do whatever we wanted to do. But back in like early 95, for me, it was just becoming something that uh, I was able to get out and look at things. So it was cool to have that element in this. Let, let's start with issues one and two. I, I love the beginning of this and how Venom is upset about the Carnage video game, which is clearly a play on Maximum Carnage, the video game. That, that kind of starts this whole thing off. The Maximum Carnage video game uh, for the Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, Game Boy, what have you, that was released in September on September 16th, 1994. So this comic, probably in production when the video game released. So I would assume they were probably putting, or at least putting the idea together behind this, because in February, this thing's on shelves. Uh, this book's on shelves. This would probably be a good marketing move that they'd done to, uh, right after the holidays, to kind of... Yeah, Carnage was a huge villain at this point. I mean, he he had hit the scene. Maximum Carnage was on the scene. This is, I agree, this ties in with trying to get the word out on Carnage. I mean, they're, they're placing their bets on one of the hot properties that they have going right now. When this came out, I mean, Carnage was fairly one of the newest big bads. This is one of the biggest character drops that I've seen in the Spider-Man universe since I've been reading comics. The whole Maximum Carnage uh, storyline is what got me into comics. And in 92, that's, you know, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah it's, weird. It's, it's weird to say that because you think 92 is, you don't think it's 30 years ago, but nope. I mean, but if you look at the Rhodes Gallery of Spider-Man, his villains go back to his inception. You know, Carnage coming in the scene as late as it did and being such a huge impact in that world because it's spun off of the other symbiotes uh, that you see uh, across the board that, you know, that has tie-ins and everything as well. So I think that this came out as a marketing ploy for the video game, which get mixed reviews. Uh, I never played it. I have it, thanks to Reddit Gift Exchange. Nice. I do I do have a copy of it, but I never played it, uh, surprisingly, because I was just a lowly boy that had not had a Super Nintendo or no. a Sega at the time. I was still on the NES. I didn't get a Super Nintendo till later. But yeah, I mean, I never got to play this, but I followed it. I fo- I know the storyline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, it's, and it's a really interesting game, too, which kind of different from the take it has on here. And this this isn't... This isn't a typical Carnage thing because if you strip this book down and st- strip this arc down, especially in the first two issues, it's basically they're making money off of yeah, dude. Cletus, Ca- Cletus <laughs> Cassidy's murders. They're marketing this. You can play because you play as Carnage. You play against Carnage. It's an online online PvP. That you actually can play against, and they market it that you can actually play against Cletus Cassidy himself as Carnage, Warden of Raven, uh, and Ravencroft. Take, yeah, uh, I had a brain fart for a minute. <laughs> has states that their all the money is going to the prison to up its abilities at its facilities. That's why they sold the rights, and that. But Carnage being Carnage, and you know Cletus being Cletus, they're a step ahead of everything when they find out that. Carnage can actually transmit itself over the internet. And it's surprising because that was dial up back then. So, I, I mean, you know, <laughs> there's words that they throw around here that if I was if I was reading this in 95, I mean, it would have felt like cutting edge to me. And they do use the word Ethernet, which is uh, a word that I think I learned about. And I know it had been around before then, but I, I had first started hearing Ethernet used a lot when I went to college. The way that our dorms were set up, they had something called like a T1 line or something. It's really fast. My buddy. He was the computer guy. So I learned a lot of my stuff about computers from him. They start. He, I remember they, he was like, man, I got to install my Ethernet card. And I'm like, what the hell is an Ethernet card? That's when I learned that there's something other than dial up. You know, they, when they started saying that they were going to use the Ethernet, I was like, oh, my gosh. I mean, I don't know if in 95, if I would have even had any idea what that meant. Just real quick. I wanted to spend something uh, out of what you were talking about with Carnage and ha- having the impact that he did. And I, I want to I'm, I'm just bringing this up because I, I don't I don't want to forget to. I want to read to you real quick. 
Uh, I just hopped on. Oh, this is Amazing Spider-Man debut villains, but I'll just go down through these, okay? And you tell me which ones you've heard because they have them in order by date of appearance, okay? So these are villains that have appeared in the Amazing Spider-Man title that fought against Spider-Man, all right? Now, I'm going to start with Carnage, okay? So Carnage was April of 92, all right? Now, I'm going to read down the rest of these, and I want you to tell me if you have ever heard of them as a villain. And the reason I'm bringing this up is like, you know, Carnage, just like you said, had a huge impact. Let's see if any of these other villains that pop up in here are even match it. So we got Black Tarantula. Ever heard of him? Nope. Morlin. Nope. Shathra. Uh, that sounds like a sexual toy. <laughs> <laughs> no, gray, gray Goblin. No, Mister Negative. I've heard of Mister Negative. Yeah, I was gonna say I think I've I've read something with him in it. Overdrive. No. Uh, speaking speaking of sex toys, Screwball. No. <laughs> Massacre. Nope. Panda Mania. I would have for uh, <laughs> I know, but I think that that's a giant panda that has is on the loose okay and it's wearing red and yellow um, uh, that's what i was gonna say with a, a a red and yellow shirt that it rips off before each fight uh, <laughs> and and he must pose oh yes yes he must puts his little paw up to his ear and then we have regent no kindred no okay all that right there just solidifies the impact that carnage has had because yeah so nothing there that Mr. Negative, I mean, that's pretty much the only one I've heard out of that entire list. And it's been like a mention, not not like a full fledged full fledged thing. But yeah, I mean Carnage is like Carnage is the latest big bad that has the big it's the newest newest rogue that has the biggest impact. Yeah. Because when you think of the Rhodes Gallery, you instantly think of the original Sinister Six and you know, just uh, a little few branches of that. And, and mm -hmm. I mean, that's what that's your go to when you think of the Rhodes Gallery. I mean, you look at all the Spider-Man movies, they go back to that that Rhodes Gallery of the familiar. And then you see branching out when they did Venom. And we won't even talk about the the Venom after scene because I don't I don't want to be that negative on this. We're, we're staying <laughs> positive. But when I heard that they was going to do Carnage, I was hoping for more of the Maximum Carnage, but they came out, they said they can't do the Maximum Carnage due to license agreement. With a yeah. lot of characters, you would need to be in there, yep. namely Spider-Man. What I, but I, what I would have liked them to do, uh, but it would have been, I think it would have been too recent story arc. I would have loved to see them do the Cult of Carnage that just came out that dovetailed into Absolute Carnage. Okay. Uh, which is both very good reads. It takes the um, the Carnage mythos and turns it up to eleven. Yeah. So it, it's it's very good. It's a very good read. Cult kind of dovetails into Absolute. And you kind of, I mean, they kind of, kind of go head and hand in head, kind of like the last last show we done when we covered Red Goblin. God, that feels like it's been so long ago and it hasn't has. been. I know, dude. It, they kind of dovetail into that. So, I mean, Carnage is a major player in the Spidey you know, Spidey mythos. People kind of don't give him, don't realize that he's relatively new in you know in terms of his Rose Gallery. Absolutely. What do you what do you think about them drilling down on uh, Carnage's psychosis? I mean, this is I don't know if this was explored prior to this book. Uh, I know that obviously the books that we've read him in or I should say I have read him in. He's clearly insane. He's clearly psychotic. He's uh, almost chaos incarnate. He's wanting to kill people just left and right because he can. But this is the first time I've ever seen them try to like get down to the reason why or at least some of the earlier uh, incidents in his life. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of the arc that done it. There's an arc. I've got the book somewhere. I think I still have it somewhere in my house. It actually goes into a lot of his backstory, a lot of the burning down of the um, orphanage uh, and everything. This this digs into a little bit more of that, just to show it, show like how twisted he was at such an early age that got him to where he is because he is the epitome of chaos. That is mm -hmm. that is his the easiest way uh, for you know the most common people to realize the insanity of carnage 
you take Heath Ledger's Joker and maximize it by a thousand <laughs> because yeah. he is truly chaos, the epitome of chaos. He wants to see chaos, and he even states it in this book. It's the thrill of chaos, the off the rails, just no confinement, no no remorse. Uh, I mean, it talks about him killing his grandmother. Yeah, it talks. It talks about him killing. I think his his aunt's dog, and it shows him. him he drilled a hole in its head I with think, a power drill. I think it's his mom. Uh, his mom's dog. She was, oh, it was his mom. I thought it was. I was for some reason I was thinking it was his aunt. So Cletus has got a dog downstairs, and he <laughs> says the dog made a mess. Well, the mess is the fact that Cletus freaking drilled a hole in, in it, and there's blood all over the place. The mom opens up the door, sees Cletus and freaks out. He, uh, he trips her while she's going down the stairs to try and kill her or at least hurt her bad. And then she grabs the knife to kind of, I, I mean, she's enraged. And the dad comes home, sees what's going on, grabs a hammer and proceeds to beat her to death in front of Cletus. That's pretty messed up when you think about it. And then when the cops get there, Cletus says he has no idea why his dad killed his mom. Yeah. So the, I think the dad intended on just trying to save Cletus, but obviously killing her with a hammer is going just a little bit overboard. However, you can just see that I mean, he's been messed up since, like, I think that was pretty young age, probably before he was 10 years old, if that. It's pretty dark, I guess is the best word to use. Car uh, you know, Cletus has a pretty dark past. We have Dr. Camille Pazzo, I think is her name. She's the one trying to crack into Carnage's past, and she uh, becomes not a central figure into this, but Carnage, when he escapes, takes her hostage. So she kind of bit off a little bit more than she can chew. Plus, she was the one that was pretty instrumental in getting him this game uh in there which you know he sell he sells his rights he sells the rights to his likeness for the video game but he says the one thing i want to do i want to be able to play it that's the only thing i think he says he wants to do is be able to play yeah. it and they're like okay yeah you could go ahead and play it no problem what we have here is we have a beta tester with the guy that developed the game playing online against carnage and supposedly this thing is you know it's a, a sealed connection and nobody can get through to it carnage you know carnage is just playing with this one guy and then Carnage figures out that his the, the symbiote figures out that they can travel in through the internet. Now, what do you think of that power? I think it's uh, a really cool. It gives the symbiotes an extra layer. Now, what's cool about this that you mentioned was the psychiatrist that's doing this. The reason why she was advocating him using the game is because it was actually getting her into seeing what made him tick because yeah. when he was playing the game he concentrated on the game and he would just talk and and that's what's really crazy and it kind of reminded me i i, I kind of hated the fact that they kind of tried to mirror this it, it was like kind of the harley quinn joker thing because if anybody knows the backstory of harley quinn she was actually a psychiatrist that was assigned to the joker who actually fell in love with the joker who the Joker manipulated so much that she turned and because of her love for him and the rest is history. But yeah. this is, they kind of try to do that because if you think of Carnage, like I said, it's, it's chaos. It's the epitome of chaos, but he doesn't harm her. This is because of the bond that they've got that she actually has some trust with him yeah and which is which is a real like i said it was a really deep layer that people don't probably reading this don't really catch on to because like i said it's a it's a bite-sized take on carnage and venom but you don't get to see the the chaos that carnage actually is and the level of of symbolicism as that he spares her and that he actually doesn't even try to harm her not once well, actually, there's a there's a point where I think, and you could probably argue that he was just wanting to keep her as a hostage. But there's a point where she's there. I think on a prison bus, she's driving. I think Carnage had it heading straight for another like another bus full of children or something on a bridge. Anyway, she takes the she takes the bus that they are on off the bridge. Carnage could have just straight up let her die. 
I think he ends up like breaking a window or you can pretty much assume he breaks a window in the back and grabs her, grabs onto the bridge and the bus falls down to the river. Just like you said, there's yeah. a bond of some sort. When you get to the prison bus scene, what happens was Venom like chase him down. There's a, a fight ensues and <laughs> they're on this like military vehicle fighting and she's in the background saying, you know, you guys can settle this once we get stopped. It's kind of comedic in a way because you see these two alien forces fighting each other, and she's just in the background trying to speak, you know, be the voice of reason, which is really yeah. funny. Yeah, trying but to make then, sense. So they he slams Venom up against a train that, and then they take over. The, they run into a prison bus. What's important about this is all these prisoners are like after he kills all the cops because one of the co- the cops says is getting ready to shoot him. He says he said I he said I won't miss, and Carnage goes. How's your aim when the bus is out of control? And he kills the driver. Yeah. And, and you know, like these prisoners are like still chained up, swearing their allegiance to Carnage. Being like, we'll be your gang and all this. And he goes, oh, you're going to be my gang. You know, it's like he, you see that millisecond that he thinks about it. And she takes over the bus. And what it is, the, there's a another a school bus stalled on the bridge. And he says, we'll just kill the kids on it. We'll just go right through them. <laughs> she goes, no, I'm not doing that. And she takes it off, which this is a key point in the book. between, And it shows the relationship. And he goes, when he saves them, he never unhooked any of the prisoners. They're all still chained up. And he goes, how's your first kill feel? Because oh, yeah, you yeah. just killed them. She's like, I did. And I had to make a choice. He said, yeah, but you chose. It's like, yeah, but you chose to kill them. He's trying to manipulate her and tell her that, like, you know, I didn't kill those prisoners. You did. Yeah. You're the one that drove the bus off of them, knowing that they were chained up. You're the one that killed him. He knowingly saves her, but could care anything. He has no connection to those prisoners, and it, it's and he loves it. He loves the he loves the chaos. He loves Amen. the uh, he loves the death and destruction. But yet, this person, he feels some sort of bond. In any other book, you read, Carnage does not care about anyone. Maximum Carnage, he would sacrifice, he sacrifices others that have joined his cause just to save himself. And yeah. that's the thing. But he goes out of his way to save this this doctor, and it gives you a glimpse into the humanity that's buried deep down inside Cletus and that the separation from Carnage. So talk to me about Kristen. Kristen and Eddie Brock's just ever growing concern for this poor girl that he met on the bus. It, it moves. It didn't move the story at all. It was just filler. It, it, it contributes nothing to the story arc yeah. until you get to the last, the last issue. Cause, and it could have been anybody that felt filled this role. But yeah. they they tried to give make you care about this person that Eddie and the Venusimia care about this person you could take that subplot out of the entire arc and miss absolutely nothing still come to the conclusion you do in four still have the events happen in four and get the same result and yeah. and that's what's weird about it because she as she would have factored in somehow in which i have a question for you once we get to it yeah. If she would have factored in somehow a little bit better, I think that would have been. I mean, they could they could have tied her in a little bit better. They could have had her be the one that was kidnapped to give Venom an actual. Yeah, there you, you know, go. Because if it would have tied that in, even if you just in, inserted her in with the doctor and just had the whole, you know, you've got to choose. Yeah. Have her see Eddie for who he was. And see, Carnage, and you would have had that beautiful chaos theory. Could've. Yeah, but you could have had some, could have done this way differently. If you take that subplot out of this, it moves the story. It, it contributes nothing to the story. He, he ran, randomly ends up sitting beside this person on a bus who yep. is a poet, who <laughs> is supposed to be meeting this guy that she's in love with. In New York, he's going. To, she's going to be a big star because of him, and he's a drug addict. She shows Eddie a picture, and he's got track marks on his arm and everything. You have that idea. It's like it humanizes Eddie is what it is, and that's what it's trying to be. The fact that it contri- it pushes the narrative none. It p- contributes nothing to the story till the end. You're like, 
why did I even read this? This was I, I wasted twenty minutes reading something that pertains <laughs> nothing to the actual story. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you you hit on all the notes that I had pretty much in these first two issues with Kristen. She's mixed up with this drug drug addict. I put in here she's got to be the worst judge of character I've ever seen. And he looks at this picture while they're on the bus on the way to New York. Kristen's like, take a look at the, you know, take a look at my guy. I'm gonna go look at uh, you know, I'm gonna go live with this guy. You're like, what is she doing? And Eddie's thinking the same thing. He sees this dude. He's like, he's scrawny. Just like he said, he's got track marks. You know, Eddie's just immediately concerned with this poor girl. But you can tell he doesn't want to stick his nose where it doesn't belong. So he just kind of says, okay, well, hey, you need to just watch out for yourself. Now, if it would have remained at that, okay, that's fine. Uh, But it seems like that just continues to nag at him throughout the first two issues. Oh, I I sure hope. Kristen's okay. I sure hope she's all right. I mean, he even watches her get into the cab with skeezy guy. Clive, I think is his name or something. He watches her get into the car with him. And it's like, oh, Kristen, I sure hope she's okay. I'm like, this is a really weird, random encounter. Why is he so obsessed with this girl? But just like you said, it humanizes him a little bit. But I put down here that I was annoyed. And that was just in the first two issues. I was annoyed by it. What would have been even better is like if she was coming to be one of the the beta testers for the game, you know, put her in the penthouse as yeah. one of the ba- as one of the beta testers and just gave her some stake in the in the the arc itself because he gets to he gets to New York, hears about Carnage being released and he's chasing the Carnage down but he's like, "Well, I really hope she's okay." <laughs> and it's like, "Okay, you you're a random stranger versus you're basically one of your, your mortal your, enemy, your mortal enemy your, almost. Yeah, one of your most formidable foes. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting there chasing, you're driving driving to find Carnage and you're worried about a stranger you met on a bus. Yep, yep. And I guess this is 90s comics per se. It, it's annoying, like you said. It, it, if they would have tied well, it in and had some kind of payoff, I, would, I wouldn't be so bitter about it, but there's yeah. no payoff. It just could have been done better. I think that's the main thing. Well, okay, so issues three and four, I mean, we're working our way up to the conclusion of the book itself. We learn more about Carnage and, well, I should say Cletus's backstory, and that's where I think we learn about his grandma was his first yeah. kill. Like, she, she, I think, really liked these little trinkets or something, or maybe yeah. they were little porcelain figurines and he trashes them and lays them across the steps and she's she walks up you know she's at the top of the steps she sees them and then he just pushes her down the steps and uh the line was i had to sit there and wait for them to come discover her so i could get something to eat she's crying <laughs> And uh, and Carnage is planning on unleashing hell upon all of the Internet. I mean, all of the Internet. I guess that's that's his goal here is he was going to I mean, as he's flying around town, I should say, driving around town and then going in the sewers with Camille as his hostage, uh, Dr. Pazzo, he finally goes to uh, what's his name? Fordham. Fordham Rhodes's opulent mansion. This is the president of excessive violence video games. He shows up at the house. There was a big to-do that Fordham had got together all these beta testers so they could play against Cletus online. Carnage is like, well, you know what? I'll do you one better. So he shows up there. Uh, and if I remember correctly, the beta testers don't believe it's him or think that it's a big show that uh, Fordham has put on. Yada, yada, yada. At the end of things, Carnage is going through the Internet, killing these beta testers. I think he kills one at first. There's a good possibility. I think he kills all of them sh- shortly thereafter. <laughs> well, when he first shows up, they're like, ha, huh, because they're getting impatient that they can't play. Yeah. They're getting, and then Carnage shows up and they go, oh, this is the greatest marketing employee ever. You hired somebody to show up. Uh, you know, and then he goes... Th- and one of them's being really snarky and Carnage goes and kills him. And they go, oh, that's, I know fake blood when I see is that pizza sauce. <laughs> so, and it arcs Carnage and Carnage is prideful and it's, it shows Carnage is prideful because yeah. they're like making fun of him and it just escalates. And so he kills everybody. What we need to go back and touch on real quick is the guy that developed the game was a lowly computer programmer sure. who who was the the basically the brains behind this. He manipulates him and kills him, and that's what kicks off everything in the the first uh, issue. But he kills him, and after he hacks the 
hacks the um, security system for Carnage to get out. And these people are start mocking the president of the company, saying that Sherman was the, the brains behind it and everything. And it kind of gets to the point where the president of the gaming company tells Carnage, so we'll set you up a, an account in the Cayman Islands. Nobody will know where you'll get all the revenue. You'll get all these profits and stuff. Just don't just don't hurt me. We can use this. And, and instead of being fearful for his life, he's like, we can make this. This is great marketing. Oh, this yeah. is great publicity. And it shows you how slimy and skeezy this guy is. There's a point in like the first, I think in the first couple issues, it might have been in the first interaction we see between Fordham and Sherman where they're talking about the video games. To this day, they still use the model where uh, I want to find it here and read it specifically because it matches exactly what peop- what these video game companies do today. Are you talking about the we'll give it to them free and then we'll make yes. them pay for content? Yep, yep, yep. And I'm like, dude, that was this was 95 when this was being said. And almost, well, definitely 26 years later, things have not changed. They will, well, Fortnite's perfectly a great example of what that is because my sons, both my sons play Fortnite. It's a free game, completely free. But you want to get something to differentiate yourself from the rest of the crew? You want yourself a nice new skin? Uh, you want yourself a nice new weapon? Well, you got to pay out the nose for that. Call of Duty's the same way. Yeah. It's not a huge commentary on it, but there's definitely like this sliver of commentary that this book is talking about uh, in, in regards to video games, video game culture. Well, OK, so Carnage, he's killed all the beta testers and now his big plan is to go out and he's he wants uh, he wants them to connect to the Internet and go live. Uh, so I, I believe what he's going to do is he is just going to go line to line or or however he's going to get his symbiote to do this. Uh, he is going to kill some people, a lot of people. And now Venom through the book has, has finally figured out what he is going to do. He got hit by the train there, I think, at the end of issue two. He's recouping within issue three. And that's where we get to kind of like our climax for our B plot. And that is when Eddie Brock slash Venom, he finds Kristen. He's able to find her house uh, or where she's living with Clive in an apartment. It's not a house. Trust me. Uh, the skeezy apartment above this diner or something like that. Clive shows up. Kristen's like, you want me to call you an ambulance? And he's like, no, because he's wanted. And Clive knows this. Clive shows up and is like, yeah, he's a wanted man. And at that point, Venom believes, and I believed, for a B-plot that really does nothing to the narrative, it was a weird twist when Clive confronts Eddie. Eddie is like, he starts to become Venom. Clive is scared to death, so scared, he ends up backing up, falling over a railing like a three or four floors to the ground. And Kristen believes that Eddie's killed him. But anyway, the point of that is, is that Kristen then explains to Eddie that Clive was actually not a drug addict, that he was a, a writer who was putting himself in the position of being a drug addict so he could write about the culture of yeah. drug addicts. And I was like, what? What? Oh, okay. So, I mean, it was a weird twist, but here's what I figured out. I say I figured this out. Uh, this was me reading a comment from somebody, and I was like, okay, there's probably a longstanding history as to why this may be in there. The comment said, I'm really getting tired of the Eddie accidentally hurt somebody and feeling guilty afterwards. That apparently has been going on. Eddie slash Venom hurt, hurts or kills somebody and therefore he continues to question himself and feel guilty and feel evil, I guess, or something like that. That's the only thing I could get out of it is that he accidentally killed this dude and now he feels bad about it. That's it. Now, there is one panel at the end. I'll go ahead and talk about it right now. I'm not going to wait till the very end because the cliffhanger is very much not a cliffhanger. OK, although if you were reading this book at this time, you'd be like, oh, crap, what's going to happen at the very end of this? Kristen blames Eddie for killing Clive and or, well, he's not dead. He's he's paralyzed. So she blames Eddie for doing this to him and says, I've got to get revenge somehow. No, I got to get justice. I got to get justice. So she turns not to the cops. She turns to her mom and she says, Mom, you know, I need I need justice. And she's like, I don't know about justice, but I can get you revenge. Venom does does have a moral compass. You have the lethal protector arc uh, and everything because he's an antihero. I would put him on par with the antihero uh, as for Frank Castle. They do some sh- 
but yeah. they have good intentions. <laughs> yeah. But it's typ- it's typically, you know, when they're doing it, it's typically to someone who deserves it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you could have just wrote this in as having a female being berated as Eddie's trying to lick his wounds and, you know, use the symbiote to heal. Eddie intervenes. Guy guy gets uh, critically injured due to the inter- interference. Eddie has a, a question of morality and lobster, as Mark Radledge would say. Hey, you would have got the same. You would have got the same results. I mean, the exact same results. Yeah, dude. Because when I was reading that last panel, the way she's drawn, I honestly thought it was the psychiatrist, which would have been a really cool payoff. Yeah, would have. Uh, I mean, that would have been decent. I mean, it, you it would have made a little bit of sense, maybe. It would have, and it could have tied everything together. You, if you would have done that, that B plot would not have been wasted. You would have had, oh, okay, this is what ties up a lot of loose ends. This is interesting. I mean, it didn't even have to be her mother. It could just been like her, a relative, a friend, and just be like, you know, she's dealing with grief, and they goes, well. Because of the interactions earlier on the storyline, if it would have been the psychiatrist, that would have been a really good payoff because the psychiatrist knows the weaknesses of Carnage, which would also be the weaknesses of Venom. Center Takes All, Volume 1, Number 3. Last paragraph of the synopsis says that Kristen's mother makes a reappearance. Okay. All right. So, and apparently she's talking to uh, a new character, which she Venom, Jason Teasley, she Venom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not who Kristen's mother is, but it is uh, uh, she Venom is on the front cover of this book. So it looks like Kristen's mother does get involved. OK, so that's that's issue three. I don't even think she ever gets named. We'll call her Karen. Karen, I'll agree 100 percent. It's funny because they just continue to call her Kristen's mother. Kristen's mother. Kristen's mother. Kristen's um, mom has nothing going on. No, Why do we put her in this story arc? <laughs> Uh, all right. Enough about Kristen and her mom. <laughs> Cl- poor Clive. Venom and Carnage go at it quite a bit through these issues, uh, and culminating on a big screen in what, what appears to be uh, Times Square or something. It's, it's some place where this big video game event was about to happen. But instead, what we have now in front of us on the screen is Venom versus Carnage in the web, being televised <laughs> through the web. Uh, so yeah, Being live streamed. On live Twitch. stream. That's right, dude. Live stream before, you know, live streaming was the thing. I, I liked it, but I didn't like it. I mean, I, I the the virtual world I didn't like because, you know, I want to see them uh, all their glory. But it did move the point along because Carnage is so distracted by this. Doctor is able to subdue Carnage because of his distraction, mm-hmm. which leads, leads to him being recaptured. So, I mean, it does move the plot along. It does have a little bit of payoff but i mean when i think of venom and carnage i want to see the all out i want to see the beatings i want to see the the strategy and stuff yeah it's cool it's way ahead of its time live streaming a battle people are doing it now making monetary gains off of it i I didn't like the fact that you know you're you're going to culminate this this arc with a virtual bitch fight i kind of agree with you is it going to have any consequences while it's online, while they're fighting online anyway? I mean, I know the symbiotes are somehow, what's the word, uh, integrated into the internet. Carnage ends up getting thrown out the window, but Venom saves him. Uh, it goes back to the moral compass comment that I made earlier. Uh, Venom would rather see Carnage rot than die. I mean, it's kind of like the adage of without a good villain, you can't be a hero. Without Carnage, you're not going to see the heroism that you find in Venom because Carnage is the ultimate antagonist to him. They're yin and yang from each other. Of course, Carnage is actually a spawn of Venom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he goes on to have even more crazier kids, but that's that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> but when it comes down to it, there's nobody on the level of Venom. Uh, strategically and power wise i mean spider-man is a better str- to you know battle venom when needed mm-hmm. but the power level is not there he has to outthink him and I'm not saying carnage is a slouch but i mean uh venom is a slouch but carnage because you need somebody like venom who isn't 
all rainbows and butterflies and the good guy he has that gray area to make the tough decisions that would need to subdue carnage so i liked the fact that the morality of him coming out saying he would rather see cletus suffer and solitude than to get peace through death we got to keep carnage around obviously we can't let him we can't let him die i mean i think what happened is that he ends up getting one of the ladies there throws like some bourbon on him or some whiskey or some type of alcohol and then yeah. catches him on fire and he just launches his own butt out a window well, I mean, he's obviously in screaming pain. Heat's one of the one of his weaknesses. But yeah, he jumps out of a window and Venom is able to save him before he hits the ground. So yeah, it's, it, it's weird because they they have this battle. I I thought at the end of this they they faced off with each other physically at some point, but that's not the case. They they waged this battle across the internet, and when it was all said and done, the only things that could go through the internet are the symbiotes. So it's not like they could take the physical body of Cletus or or Eddie Brock into the internet with them. It's just the symbiotes that are waging war against each other on the internet. And then when the fight's over with, they kind of, you know, they both re retreat back to their respective places. I think v Venom is at some kind of somewhere down in Times Square or whatever. Cletus is still in the skyscraper. So anyway, um, it, it was an interesting ending. Did the computer jargon take you out? Uh, not really. I mean, I think they tried, they went over the top with it. But it really didn't take me out of it that much. I mean, okay. Uh, now somebody reading it, but also you got to think. You know, we're we're talking reading this in 2021 versus when it was published. We're reading that when it was published. I think it would have. You got to take into account the knowledge you gain through computer interaction, computer terminology. It was a lot easier to follow along because, but back then, maybe a bit of a different story. It's like a period piece. And here's here's the reason why I'm saying that. So yeah, back then we're looking at this. They're talking all this techno babble. Uh, you know, I think is the word that that, that was being used. You know, Ethernet, heat shield, and a lot of computer talk and talking about the internet and the world wide web and you know kids at that point a teenager is probably going to know what that's about a younger kid maybe not but uh, regardless it, if you weren't in the know of what technology was like back uh, at that point then uh, it, it might have been tough for some people but just like you said it's 2021 me and you have lived through that age there are some jokes. I want to even say, call them jokes. There's some references in here that if I gave this comic book to my kid, they wouldn't have any idea what was what they were talking about. Now, specifically this one, I, I posted, I think, on my on the Facebook page. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, Venom is trying to get this guy to get him connected to the Internet so he can fight Carnage. Venom says, is this computer hooked up with the one where Carnage is? Don't just stand there with your jaws flapping. Answer us. And this tech guy looks at him. He says, his modem is talking to my modem even as we speak. Hear those squawks and beeps? Now, when's the last time you heard that? And that's what's funny because, I mean, you know, back then it's a dial-up. You know, that's dial-up. Yeah, so, I mean, I the the video feed couldn't be very great. No. I mean, you know, I, I would assume there was a lot of buffering. So you probably didn't see the fight a millisecond play, then buffering, buffering, buffering. Yep. That would have been horrible. All right. You you have the floor, sir. I've, I've hit all my talking points. I don't really have anything else to say other than just make sure, ladies and gentlemen, we kind of bagged on it, but it looks like Clive Gooch and Kristen and Kristen's mother do play a little bit more of a part in center takes all just from when I was going through the synopsis, you get a, uh, you at least get a conclusion to that. So we bagged on it earlier, but you will get a conclusion. It does factor into the center takes all story. So Teasley, what, what do you got to say, man? What's, what's your final thoughts on this book? Nice little piece to look into. If you're wanting to just get a, a get an idea of the inner and carnage of Venom's interactions together but I'm, I'm pretty sure we've covered just about everything that we need to cover about this story i agree well then let's go ahead we'll get into plugs man uh what do you got going on did someone say plugs this would be a good time to plug a sponsor for the w2m network and that is grammarly for you the listeners of source material grammarly is offering a free download of the grammarly software grammarly's ai powered products help people communicate more effectively grammarly helps you write mistake free on gmail facebook twitter linkedin and nearly anywhere else you write on the web grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar punctuation and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors improving your vocabulary and suggesting style 
style improvements. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Again, that's getgrammarly.com slash W, the number two, M network to download Grammarly for free. When this drops, go check out the second and short podcast where me and Ty have been doing some great work. We've got some chemistry, not as good as me and you, Jesse, as of yet. Yeah, but, it'll, it'll come. Um, it'll come. I'm on the second and short podcast uh, as the fantasy football guru. If anybody knows me, knows that I'm very into fantasy football. And I've been able to uh, join their team and be able to give my insight and takes on all things fantasy football related. So, if you have any questions or feel free to just drop me a line at W2M chairman on Twitter. All right. Very good. Well, uh, folks, you can catch me at Stiznarki on Twitter. You can follow the show at source Matt I know we're airing this in conjunction with uh, the venom release. So I think tomorrow, damn you, Hollywood venom two will be hitting the airwaves. So just kind of keep an eye out for that. We do the unspoken issues podcast. It's myself, Chris Armstrong, Dean Compton, uh, a couple of the other guys, uh, for the unspoken decade. That's a fun 90s comics. This thing would have fit right in there. I'll tell you right now that uh, 90s comics have a good time talking about that on unspoken issues. Yeah, keep an eye out for those tripped up trivias. Since, since you know, Venom 2 does have carnage, definitely be able to hear my take on that because I'm pretty sure me and Robert Winfrey will have a lot to say about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'll be good stuff. All right, for Jason Teasley, I am Jesse Starcher. We'll be talking to you next time. Have a good one. Bye-bye.